The next presentation will be site 1117, which is land east of the A4155, and it's also known as the old Wyvale site. And the speaker on this one will be Alex Hersham. So if I could pass over you, to you, Alex, if you want to take over the screen. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me present my screen. It's all right, no rush. Great. You should be able to see a presentation that says Wyvale Garden Center update. Is that the one that you can see? That's fine, thank you. Great. So this will be familiar to many of you. Um, I wasn't sure who was gonna be on this call. So I've given a few slides at the beginning for anyone that wasn't part of the planning process historically or the neighborhood plan steering group historically, but it's definitely a pleasure to be back in front of you all. Um, just background firstly on the site, and then I'll come to the planning background, and then I'll come to the proposal on the why. So the site you can see there in the top left-hand side is the almost sort of rectangular area um, in red. Uh, it's on the corner essentially of the A4155 with direct access to that road um, on Bolney Lane as well. Um, we'll talk more about its location relative to um, bus stations, petrol, um, train stations, et cetera, in a moment. But just to give you some sense of where it is relative to um, uh, Ship Lake Station. Um, and without trying to draw too pretty a picture, to give you a sense of where Thames Farm is um, in terms of the development that's going to come around and, and the sort of what, what the area might look like in a few months or a few years' time. Henley's you know, sort of up the road, if you look in the top part of that, that diagram. Again, we've carved out the site in red there for context. And what I wanna do with this slide really quickly is explain the public access transportation links from the site. So immediately um, uh, sort of to the, to the north of the site, there was the um, area where it went from 50 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour. That's been moved even further north as part of the planning permission that was granted. So we will be moving that even further north. So in a 30 mile an hour zone, what you can see is we're on a very large straight path of the road. So there's good visibility, hundred meters in either direction. There's two bus stations right outside the site with buses coming every 30 minutes as part of the planning application that was granted by SODC. Um, the owners will be investing further in those bus stops. Um, there is a direct access to the road. This was the access that was historically used by the garden center, which had quite a significant amount of traffic um, coming in or, or car traffic coming in and out of the site. Um, there is, as I said, two bus stops right outside and there's a footpath um, down onto Northfield Avenue that's being resurfaced as part of Thames Farms application that takes you about 800 meters all the way down to Ship Lake Station. So in terms of the, the accessibility from the site, you have good access to the street, you have a good clear crossing um, via an inward footpath that I'll show you later. Sorry, I dropped for a second there. Two bus stops. So overall, a very sustainable and accessible site. Um, and this is just talking a little bit more about what I shared just there. Um, in terms of the bus stops, the walk to the train station, the visibility either way. And then some analysis we did when we put the planning application in place, we looked back to when it was a garden center um, and there were never any major road accidents outside, something that we all took quite a lot of comfort in from the site's safety and accessibility standpoint. This is what the site looks like today. Now, thankfully with the planning permission already achieved, it won't look like this for much longer. Um, but it is, it is a derelict site. Um, there was a lot of support in large part because of the fact that it was a brownfield derelict site. Um, and it's been used for antisocial behavior despite our best efforts. But thankfully it won't look like this for very much longer as we look to start development. And for background, um, there's currently planning approved by SODC outline planning consent for 40 homes of which 40% of those will be affordable. So 16 will be affordable and up to 10,000 square feet of commercial space. 
And you know, um, many of you will know this intimately, but for those who don't, we worked really closely with the neighborhood plan steering group before submitting a planning request. Um, there was various feedback sessions around design, sustainability, access, uh, obviously the affordable amount, 40%, the architects used. I remember many a coffee with Kester around our architects. Um, the neighbor plan steering group actually resolved to support the application and planning was approved almost unanimously by SODC. Um, there was one vote against it who did comment before he voted saying there's no real planning reason to vote against it, but that's by the by. Um, the chair of the neighborhood plan spoke in favor of the application at the meeting. Um, SODC councillor for Henley and, um, uh, spoke in favor and SODC councillor at the time for Harpson and Shiplake came and spoke in favor of the development. So there was broad support for the development at the time. I think we worked really closely and collaboratively as a community to bring it forward. Um, and where we are today is, as I said, a plan commission for 40 homes and up to 10,000 square feet of, a for of commercial. Um, and on those 40 homes, a commitment that 40% of those would be affordable. And we worked very closely with SODC to make sure that the site layout um, sort of pepper potted those affordable homes so it could really feel like one community. The outline plan also included some investment in making the site even more sustainable than it already is, um, some speed calming measures, um, including moving that 3050 junction further north, but other things that we've invested in too at our expense, um, investment in the two bus stops right outside the site, which are a critical component of its sustainability, investment in the crossing towards the footpath. And um, obviously, as I mentioned before, that footpath is being resurfaced partially as a result of Thames Farm. And just as a background, it's a brownfield previously developed site. There's no issues regarding transport and traffic, ecology, schooling, flood risk, et cetera. And that's why it, it passed um, almost unanimously or many of the reasons why it passed almost unanimously at SODC. So this is, this is the outline plan for the site. What you can see on the right-hand side there is the entrance. And so the road going up to Henley lives across the right-hand side here. It's elevated, so at the back, you had a significant incline to the street level, which gives lovely views. You can see a large open village green here in the middle, something we're committed to, and then 40 homes, um, as I mentioned, with um, a nice sort of mix, you know, not, not that many very large homes, more skewed towards one, two, and three beds. And then what you can see down here in the bottom right is the commercial or employment area. For the keen eye of you, you'll see a little exit here. There's actually this footpath access out of the site directly to the crossing. So residents or workers don't have to walk along the main road, but that's just a nice touch around sustainability. But you have this very large area of the site that's currently designated um, for employment use. I've gone over this already, so in the interest of your time, I know it's late on a Thursday evening, I'm not going to again, but just some, some uh, uh, sustainability points again about the site. In terms of the plan designs, these were, these were part, uh, submitted as part of the application, and th this is sort of a mood board of the type of design for the um, shared space, the very large shared communal green, some around the houses, um, which you can see really in keeping with um, the area. Um, some elevations for, I believe these are the, the, the two beds um, and the three beds, just as an example, there's many one beds, two beds, three beds, and a few four beds as well. And then just some, um, some materials that we had um, planned to use as part of the application. And again, for those of you that have seen me present before, you would have seen these exact slides um, many times before including the hedging, the trees, the woods, trying to make sure that it, it, it really is in keeping with the local setting. And I know that was very important to many and also frankly important to us. So the fun part, the proposal, or at least what we put forward to the neighborhood plan steering group as part of this discussion. So to summarize the proposal, um, it's to take it from 40 homes that are currently allocated to 60, so an additional 20 homes. On the 40 homes currently allocated, we would keep the affordable at 
On the incremental 20 homes, nine of them would be affordable. So that's more like 45% on the incremental 20 homes. So the overall affordable percentage would be 42%, which I think is, um, you know, it's really part of the proposal that we wanted to put forward to show our best intentions here around delivering something back to the community. Um, and because we, we propose to remove that commercial space, and I, I can go on for ages as to why I think that commercial space is perhaps doomed, but that's a separate point. Um, there'd be a very limited impact on the overall size of the development. In fact, there might be no impact on the overall amount of space developed with those additional 20 homes. So the benefits of the proposal um, uh, are as follows. Nine more affordable homes representing 45% of the incremental homes allocated. Um, we don't end up building commercial space that sits empty. I'll talk in a moment about how that might eventually come back to being residential anyway. There would be minimal increase in the overall floor space. Importantly, as we proved quite extensively when submitting planning, actually when you reduce commercial space and replace it with residential, there's a reduction in traffic, a significant reduction. And I'll show you an image on the next slide that represents that, especially at peak times. So a reduction in traffic and the development will be more in keeping with the overall area. I think it's fair to say two points. Um, firstly, if we do go ahead with 40 homes plus commercial, that's fine, we'll do it in, in good faith. If, if, as I suspect, that commercial does not get fully taken up, it's very likely that that commercial would be redeveloped over time into homes. And I say this more to point towards the future as to what would likely happen. And the second thing is, given the low density that's been proposed on the site today, you know, if, if, if Derry Lane would go back and propose 40, uh, 50 homes rather than 40 homes as it is, and the commercial space, it's likely that that will have to be approved. Um, and it's likely that SODC would be able to dismiss that given the low density. So the proposal here today is really a proposal that we work together, we deliver um, more affordable than otherwise would be delivered, and we do something that reduces traffic and is more in keeping with the area. This is just a visual that um, shows the traffic impact, vehicle generation. Um, it, it shows us a, a scenario where there's commercial space versus residential space. As you would expect, the graph with the orange that looks more favorable is the residential space versus the blue. And in particular, you can see the very big blue spikes at the beginning of the day, um, you know, eight to nine. At lunchtime, there's another spike and then in the afternoon. And those spikes in terms of total trips are significantly more as commercial space than as residential space. So again, um, looking back at removing this 10,000 square feet of commercial space, um, it could easily fit these 20 homes. 45% of that of those homes would be affordable. They'd likely be smaller homes. So skew towards two bed rather than larger homes given the location on the site and given um, the sort of appropriateness and what's needed locally. Um, and as I mentioned before, it's likely that, and, and you know that we've been, we marketed the site for seven years before this, it's likely that the majority of the commercial area would sit empty, not all of it. Uh, you know, I know the vet might be interested, et cetera, so not all of it, but the majority would sit uh, empty anyway and would likely come back as residential in a few years time, perhaps in a less favorable way. And here's just some fun images of all the marketing that we did over seven years. And I, I put it at the end there, and now COVID. I think that um, out of town, out of city sites, which are not very um, you know, convenient, let's say for business parks, this was never really a site that was gonna be an excellent site for commercial. It was historically um, you know, given with an eye for it being for Bremont, which moved elsewhere. And I think now, with, um, with, all the, with all the information we have over several years of marketing, plus what's happening with COVID, it's highly unlikely that this, the commercial area gets, gets used. And that's it. I'm happy to go into more detail, but hopefully you'll see a sort of continued collaborative approach and something that I think is, is good, for the, good for Henley and Harpston um, and hopefully good for the community. 
Okay, thank you, Alex. If we can have our screen back. Yes, sir. Go and do that. Oh, that's the wrong thing. Sorry, one second. Okay, excellent. Right, let's take questions from, uh, is Kester still there? Yeah. You gone? Right, anybody else from the working group? I'll come to you afterwards, Matthew, okay. I did say the working group first. Anybody from the working group like to speak first? I'll ask a question. Uh, Patrick Fleming. Yeah, uh, Alex, you, thank you for the presentation and thank you for the update on, on your thinking on this. Uh, what, what you haven't done really there is to indicate the sort of distribution because you've got a block of industrial at the moment on that <coughs> south southern corner. Can you give us an idea of how the houses would be, how would the distribution change? Do you mean distribution in terms of size or layout or, or the... In terms of layout. Yeah, so, so um, what's likely, because that, that um, commercial area, um, because at the time we acknowledged that it was unlikely to be taken up, we left it as, a, as, a, as an area of the site. And with SODC, we said whatever comes forward, we will build and we guarantee to build a minimum amount. What would likely be the case, if you think about that as a mini rectangle, is it would be a courtyard approach um, with some, with some um, potentially some, some flats, some smaller houses, um, sort of almost um, weaving in and then weaving back out again. So you wouldn't really see, I, I probably should have put it in the presentation and apologies for that, but it, it won't be a very dense block. It's actually quite a large area of land. Um, if you've walked it, it's where a lot of the garden center currently sits. Um, and it could easily fit um, sort of, uh, you know, the, the 20 houses proposed, but I'm happy to share an image um, with some architect drawings as to what that could look like. But because it will skew towards slightly smaller homes, which I think are what's needed in the community, if I may say so, um, that uh, it, would, it would fit quite easily without being in any way dense and there would be a courtyard approach with a bit of an open space um, around it. Thank you. Who next? Matthew, would you like to come in here? Yeah, sure. Um, Alex, thank you very much for your presentation. I thought that was excellent. Um, I, I guess I've got a, um, I guess, as a member of the public, am I allowed to make statements or just ask questions? How does it work? Well, you're, you're here, with, I believe, as Harpson Parish Councillor. Okay, cool. So um, I think the first statement, I would, I would, as a statement initially, is I'm, I'm not convinced of the justification that the commercial property is not viable. Um, as a derelict site, I can see why people wouldn't move into it. As a newly built property, I could see that being very desirable. I think as a result of COVID, we're going to see more people working from home and working remotely. Um, and I think there's an argument to say that potentially that could be a great site. But I think that's, you know, that's something that's open for discussion. I think um, this, the second, the, the question I have really is, I think, you know, we talked a lot about social housing and, and your commitment to the community and wanting to put something into it. Um, something we're all very aware of is that social housing doesn't really work in Henley because it's basically too expensive for people. Um, we had a very good presentation earlier where people were talking about the opportunity to put property into a trust where it truly does become affordable for key workers and local residents. Is that something that you would potentially consider with this site? Yeah, so um, thank you for your points. I don't believe we've met in person before, so it's- No, we haven't, I'm afraid. Um, um, firstly, on your first point, I would, I, I take your point that we might enter a new world. Um, if you look at the Regis locally, you'll get a pretty good understanding of how they're doing from an occupancy perspective. What I can say is we have seven and a bit years behind us of marketing the site, marketing the site both as is and as a fully developed site. Um, the, the site, the background to the site was always that Bremont might go there. And that's why it was, it's, it's pretty clear to me that um, it won't be fully utilized. And that's why I wanted to be honest in the presentation, which is that if it doesn't get utilized, it will come back for residential 
and that conversation will be a different conversation at the time um, because that will just be a, a you know direct with the council conversation. In terms of in terms of the affordable, listen, I think it's super important. I, I think it's super important. That's why um, in the proposal there'll be forty two percent, which I which I um, I hope isn't the largest because I hope other people are offering similar amounts because that's what what's needed locally. We've spoken in the past about who we would partner with because obviously as an affordable um, site, you have to partner with a registered provider. And we've spoken a lot about partnering with, with the local registered prov provider. I believe it's called Henley and Local, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, rather than the district um, uh, 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 registered providers. And that's something that we explored in the past. Those are conversations which are still open. Um, and I think that was a really important part of our strategy to make sure that these homes, um, these affordable homes across the spectrum were given to, to people that, that needed it locally to key workers, to your point. I think in terms of putting in a trust, because it, would be, it, it wouldn't be um, the owner selling or leasing out these, it'd be working with a registered provider, preferably a local registered provider who understands the needs of the community. Um, uh, uh, that is, I believe, the best way forward, the best way forward for the community, because they have the lists, they have the, the local need, um, uh, et cetera. So I do think that is genuinely the best approach. Um, it's not an approach that significantly alters from our perspective, but I do think it's the best approach for the community that it's with a local provider who understands what's needed by whom um, and are able to drive that forward. And that's, that's something that I've been quite um, committed to and, and, and vocal about from the beginning of our conversations with the steering group many years ago. Did that answer your question, uh, Matthew? Um, yeah, to a degree, I think, yes. Okay, thank you. Kester, would you like to come in? Was that a yes or a no? We can't hear you. He's muted. Mm. Can I jump in, Ken? It's Sarah. I can't see you, but yet you can do. Um, um, I just wanted to ask Alex, are you talking about social housing or affordable housing? Because there's a distinction, isn't there? Yeah, it, it, it's it's we um, when we put the plan forward that was approved by SODC, it was 40 percent in line with the mix of affordable housing, which includes different buckets of of um, affordable. So there's shared ownership, affordable rent, etc. That was in line with SODC's um, best practice. So we followed to the sort of letter of the law, SODC's best practice around affordable. So that's not, it's not housing association housing, or what we used to call council housing. Um, no, but it, it's, it's a registered provider. I, I can't that's remember. Very, that's, that's all I wanted to know. It's not, it's not a housing association housing that you're talking about. Well, it would be taken over by a registered provider um, who would run it. Which, which would probably be a housing association. Exactly. It would. So it, is, so, so it is social housing you're talking about? No, they'd be affordable, but they're taken over by a housing association. They don't call themselves social housing. Right. Yeah. So there ends up being a mix between um, shared ownership that allows yeah. people to get on the ladder with actually quite a small down payment and affordable or socially rented, I can't remember the exacts, that really gear towards key workers um, having having affordable places to live. So it's not, just to be super clear, it's not a price set by us. It, it, that's not how it works. Yeah. Okay. I've got uh, Lawrence and Michelle to speak next. Lawrence first. Yeah, uh, just going to clarify one bit. It would be exactly what someone like Soha already provides. If you go onto the Soha website, that's exactly what they do. You, okay. you look at your eligibility criteria and you either go for between 50 and 75% shared ownership and then you pay rent above that. Or if you're less eligible, you can go onto a social rent. Or if you're above 55 and don't have employment, you go into that tranche. So it is exactly what so all of you do. It's just not quite what we've been discussing on some of the other applications about a community land trust, which would be a maybe Henley or Henley Harpston specific new entity, which would then be managed by a board. But realistically, the, the main difference between a community land trust that say Henley and Harpston may manage together 
would be we could just help eradicate some of the short, uh, some of the errors that currently occur in the current social housing system or SOHA, where in the future they can get sold or it's not in perpetuity. So that's that's just a subtle variation. I'm sorry for you, Alex, which is the community land trust that we've been discussing on some of the other applications is an in perpetuity, almost Henley specific body that other areas such as TAME and districts like that have already set up and are doing. Um, that was that bit. But then on, on the other bit, just to echo Matthews, um, or sorry, Mr. Phillips, um, you know, I do find it difficult as a local businessman whenever someone says kind of like res a commercial space isn't viable because it completely depends what's on offer. And I, I understand your point with Regis, but you only have to throw a stone 50 yards from Regis to see the second area of Newtown Road as well. And it's a thriving little business hub. You've got the barbers down there and you've got Rend, who are like one of the South leading CNC and CAD design agencies. And you actually have a thriving hub of businesses which have effectively set up in storage units because the demand for local business space was such that someone would take a blank storage unit just to be able to set up their business. So I do think, you know, if the right thing is done with it, it's 100% viable but you know that, that's all i'd say on that i find viability studies will come out with the answer that you uh, you wish them to uh, provide yeah but you're, but you're right there which is that newtown road i i think it's not a good thing for henley nor harpston what's happening in newtown road something that i spoke to councillor art about many years ago actually which is that which is um you know what was going to happen there with permitted development and and my fears around that newtown road though um you know is quite different it's walking distance from the town centre, walking distance. Um, you know, it's very easy to sort of live locally and work locally. Um, I'm not saying that there won't be any tenants for it. I'm not, I'm not saying that the entire 10,000 square feet will see empty. As I said, there are, there are some, and we have eight years or seven and a half years worth of data. I'm merely saying that I think this is a good opportunity for us to work together to, to best maximise what comes out of that. And for me, it's not about whether we find one or two tenants for one or 2,000 square feet. But rather, is there an opportunity now to work together to get that extra 45% affordable? Or is it more something that, um, you know, a couple of years down the road, we come back to when there's, you know, when we see with, you know, with the realities of what comes, and it will be a different conversation. No, I get that. Uh, Michelle, Thomas. Uh, hello there, Alex. Um, it's uh, Councillor Thomas here. I'm Chair of Planning for um, Henley Town Council. Um, I think what councillors are really dying to ask you is, like other landowners, some, some of the other landowners who have been um, making presentations to us over the last um, few nights, um, would your family be willing to gift that land so that we can provide 100%, 100% social housing no. <laughs> on that piece of land. Bold. <laughs> yes. Bold, bold, bold question. <laughs> I've, been, I've, been, I've, been, I've been so moved by some of the presentations that have taken, that have taken place. I've been really quite um, pleasantly surprised. And, um, perhaps, you know, it's a shame that you weren't with us, you know, early on in the presentation. Perhaps you could watch it back on YouTube. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's the way that these conversations have been going and I've been getting more and more confident as time has gone on. I would probably pass the question back actually, but I'll leave it to Alex. <laughs> All right, Councillor Arden, I thought you were going to step in there. Um, you know, there, there's currently an outline planning consent for 40 homes, including 40% affordable and 10,000 square feet of commercial. As mentioned before, I think it'd be very difficult for SODC to refuse if we went, uh, you know, if, if, if the owner went for 50 homes with the same amount of commercial. And so the proposal that I'm putting forward today, I think is a continuation of what we've done in the past, which is working collaboratively locally, um, but also realistic. Um, you know, and moving, for, moving to 45% on the incremental space is, is really meant to show our commitment, but um, has to be realistic. There's planning in place and more planning could be achieved um, and so it's, it's really about, can we work together in a way that is good for the community and, and good for everyone around, rather than something that perhaps might be a bit less realistic, given the state of play that the land is in today. You know, the land has outlined planning consent. So it's, it's hard. It's okay to say no. 
Alex, can I help you? I, I think your answer should have been: we purchased the land in the first place. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't a piece of land that was given to us. I think oh. that would have been my answer. Mm. Anyway, but I'll leave that to you. Um, Kessa, do you want to come in at all? No, thank you. You don't. Okay. Um, anybody else wish to ask any questions? Uh, uh, Lon, 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 sorry. I ask. Alex, something? Yeah, yeah, David Lloyd, and then I go to Lawrence and then Donna. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Alex, for your presentation. I've been living in Ship Lake for over 40 years, 40 years, for 43 years. And I've seen it from a small, sleepy village to, in, well, increasing day by day, more or less. There's, there are quite a fair few people here now. Would it be worth thinking about a, a, a medical centre, perhaps, in, on the site instead of the of the uh, other uh, other plans that, that you had besides the all the houses and how you can say affordable houses all the time, affordable houses around Shiplake, there aren't any. So I was wondering whether you could answer those a couple of questions, please. Of course. Thank you for the question. I'm sure you've seen in the you know, real journey being there for 40 years. Um, on, the Very second, on the second question first, if you don't mind, affordable housing um, is not uh, a price that we will set. It's, it's, a, it's set up um, by SODC. Soha is an example of a registered provider, Henley and Locals and other that genuinely mm -hmm. do make those houses affordable for young families. So it's not, it's not, a, it's not dependent on, on, on anything other than how they, how they sort of set that. And there's different ways that people can get on the ladder through shared ownership, um, where you buy a small part of it and you rent the residual, um, or through social rent or, 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 or affordable rent. So it's, it's, not, it's not saying that um, the development will make houses cheap. It's saying that 40% of the development will go to a registered provider whose job it is to make houses affordable to people, key workers, nurses, um, uh, veterinarians, uh, 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 policemen, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, I agree with you. If you look in Shiplake today, you'll struggle to find a home that's affordable. If you look in Harpster, you'll struggle to find a home that's affordable. Um, you'll find quite the opposite. That's why it's so important that if, children and grandchildren are going to stay in the area, Henley, Harpston, Shiplake, etc. This is Henley and Harpston specific, however, that developments do come forward with 40% or more affordable so that those um, housing associations um, uh, and registered providers can have access to homes to make them truly affordable. So, right. I, so I agree with what you're saying. I just think there's a distinction between how you look at it, how, you know, that there's, there aren't affordable homes today but that doesn't mean that a new development can't provide a significant chunk of affordable housing. Okay, I look forward to that. <laughs> yes, well, that's why, that's, why, that's why I think it's very important. That's why with the incremental 20 homes that we're proposing, um, nine of them would be affordable. SODC usually really pushes to get to 40%. We've proposed 45. Right. Um, what, uh, about the, what about the medical center? Because the amount of people in Shiplake now, it's it's it'll be <laughs> be a hell of a job to to find some some medical facilities soon yeah. in Henley. I, I I think that's a really interesting point. But just for context, when the site before the site was granted planning permission, it was allocated in the prior neighbourhood plan for B one, B two, or D one for commercial space, and that was because people thought that Bremont would move there, the watch manufacturer. Right. Um, never in agreement, and they moved somewhere else. I believe it's called Sheep House Farm, which is a bit further mm -hmm. than Old Correct. In, in, the, in the ensuing years after that, in the five, five years or four years, we did every little bit of marketing, every idea that came up, whether it be um, area for nursery, given the fact that Thames Farm was being developed next door with 90-odd homes and therefore children, um, a doctor's unit, medical unit, um, shared office space, 
I, I tell you honestly, it, was, it became a labor of love in terms of getting, getting the neighborhood plan steering group on, on board and then SODC on board to approve the change of use. It wasn't easy. Uh, many people on this call can, can attest to that. And, and what we did thoroughly was we looked through every single option for commercial space. It's all out there on the planning portal for our site, which I can send over after. Every single bit of analysis that we did, every offer that we had come forward, um, which were very few and far between for the site as it as is, but also for the site after we developed it as new commercial space. And there was very, very, very little demand. There were some great ideas, which includes the one I find that you that's surprising. Yes. And, okay. and, 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 and as I said, there's so much data there now, which is why I feel confident putting this forward in front of you, knowing what we now know after seven and a half years. Thank you, Alex. Okay. Thank you, David. Donna, did you still want to ask a question? I'm going to go to Jackie. I, I do, actually, because you say that site's been vacant for seven and a half years. Is that correct? No, I think the site's been vacant for longer than that, but there was formal marketing being done to find tenants for commercial space for something like that. Okay, so it's been vacant. Um, excuse my ignorance. Um, there's got to be some wildlife living there, hasn't there? Well, and being... At Thames Farm have had a lot of trees taken down for that development. I'm pretty sure some of that wildlife from there has moved on to that site. Have you checked? Yes, as part of the yes. as part when of was... Do Donna, Donna, you've asked the question. Let the man give the answer. Thank you. Let him give the answer. Thank you, Sorry. Alex. But well, first thing, first things first, as you will know, um, Councillor Crook. Yeah. When you do an application to SODC mm -hmm. for planning permission. They're very rigorous in terms of the things that they ask you to look at. Ecology, water issues, transportation, wildlife, bats assessment, etc. All of those documents are extremely well documented on our planning commission, our planning, our planning uh, proposal um, when we did it, which included retaining a significant amount of trees and planting more trees than we were otherwise going to pull down. It included a significant amount of open space, very low density, um, and, and a lot of analysis of wildlife at the time. Now, yes, granted, this was two years ago, a year and a half ago, granted. And it would be fair to ask us if we were to move forward to do that again, to ensure that the houses that we might, uh, we might build as part of this proposal um, don't impact that. But let me remind you, what, I, what I'm saying here today is, I don't want any extra space to build on because I currently have permission to build 40 homes or, or the owners have permission for 40 homes and 10,000 square feet. I'm merely saying, let's shift it slightly so it's more in keeping and there are benefits for both. But I do agree that if, if we do want to move forward and you want us to check that again, we can do a re that the owners can do a refresh of that assessment quite easily. Yeah, thank okay. you. Um, Jackie Walker and then Lawrence. Hello, uh, thank you for the presentation. I would like to build on David Lloyd's comments a bit further oh. and add that sometimes um, the need for some more services like a medical centre, like some office space, like we just provides for some a grocery store, cafe, so on, that doesn't always become clear until more of the development has happened and people are moving into houses and you realize the growth of residential. So I would still think it's worth considering that space to be have a little mix in it of services within that residential. And what do you, what do you think there, if you don't mind me asking a question back, because 10,000 square feet is um, not a little mix, it's quite a large mix of space. Um, what, 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 what are you thinking might be With, within within the residential housing and it goes counter I would always be going for more affordable more more social housing but I think it's important to be able to service the residential development that goes up and as you said with with COVID more people are working from home um, and this is not an affordable area. So going forward, I think we'll see slight shifts in people that the houses that they buy are not necessarily to the size that they need to work from home and they may need to rent close by 
so that they're not traveling distances, space where they can go um, and, and hook up to Wi-Fi there and, and do their work. People will still need to buy food and the medical services. I think there is there is something in what David Lloyd brought up that to keep some of that space within what you're doing to still consider if that could be commercial. I think it's an interesting point. Um, and, and I think we're, you know, it, it, it's more of a conceptual point than a specific point. It is worth noting, though, that obviously you can walk down to Ship Lake from the site and go to, go to the corner store there. But it's yeah. one bus stop away, I believe, or two um, to the north to Tesco, and then one further to Newtown. So um, to, to compete, to, yeah, it, 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 that, that's, that's the trouble. It's that um, city set or town center areas that are so close by make it very difficult for commercial space to compete there. I am hearing a repeated theme, though, of, well, maybe there might be a little bit of, of, of commercial space needed. Um, uh, and obviously, I have my views given the amount of marketing that was done. But that doesn't mean that this is going to fall on deaf ears. And I, and I appreciate these points. Um, I, I just as I do have a slightly stronger view given, given the history. Um, yeah. But nonetheless, I appreciate the point. I'd like to just add one little thing in that when you do that within that area, it, it creates more community is, is what I would say. Okay. Thank you. Lawrence, did you have another question? Uh, yeah, if possible. And I was actually going to I'll follow up on Jackie's quickly and say that one of our applications yesterday even stated that one of the reasons they could put their housing there was because of the potential employment on the site next door, which I just thought was ironic seeing as that would probably go now. Um, but if the powers that be and we could set up Penny and Harpston or such a body set up something like a community land trust, would you consider giving the nine affordable houses to such a body if they could go ahead? Would you mind sending some more information so I can understand yeah, that in a bit more detail? Yeah, certainly. We, I think uh, between Ken and another of others, we've looked at a few various types of bodies that do exactly that. Um, some of them are yeah, some of them are either investments or co-ops or land trusts, but they all do the same thing, which is protect it in perpetuity for That's the right. purpose it's given to. But Great. yeah, would, would love to if you'd yeah. consider. Thank you, Councillor Connell. I'm a little bit ignorant when it comes to that. So if you wouldn't mind sharing some information, then I can come back to you. I can do that. Jody, do you have any questions at all? Um, I just had a comment. Um, so the emerging South Oxfordshire local plan identifies the need for the neighbourhood plan to identify one hectare of employment land. So the loss of this would further diminish that employment land provision. Um, so it's really very important to clearly set out and evidence all of the marketing and all of the data that you've mentioned to clearly um, set that out for us to be able to um, make a decision in the future. Yeah, that, that, that will be extremely easy because this was exactly what we had to evidence to get SODC planning committee on board. It was a lot about viability, demand, getting economic development on board. And there's there's years of data, including years of data that ticks and ties with every regulation that SOD set out. Um, I, I, do, I do acknowledge that you need to find an extra hectare. Um, obviously, this is a de minimis amount relative to an extra hectare. Um, but, but nonetheless, we have that data um, clean and easy to access right off the SODC planning app, uh, portal, but I can send that to you, um, uh, Jody, too. Cool. Uh, Dr. You. Matthew Phillips. Just quickly to follow up on that, I wonder if it's possible also to see or, or to understand the marketing that's been done subsequent to the planning permission having been granted. Yeah, I mean, we, we haven't done a huge amount of marketing subsequent. Um, it was granted uh, in October of last year. Um, and then with Brexit, election, and then COVID, I can't imagine the situation would have improved, um, given that the majority of the time has been COVID since the planning permission was granted. But I'll share the data with you. I think, I think what you'll see is, is seven years of hefty data that points in, in one direction. But, but, but the point I want to make here is more than just, um, just this. It's that what, what I want to bring forward and the reason why we're, we're, we're taking this route rather than just submitting a plan which might submit a plan for 50 homes with only 40% affordable and still retain a little bit of commercial, um, 
or otherwise developing it out and then coming back in two years directly to SODC saying, I told you so, and having doing that much easier switch from a planning perspective is because I think now is an opportune time to work together to deliver extra affordable rather than going down the sort of path of least resistance, which is doing a direct application to SODC. And I do, I do want to highlight that, that, um, you know, this is an endeavor to try and work with the community, um, but those other options are available and, and would likely be fruitful. You want to come back on that, Matthew, or are you okay? Um, I, just, just very quickly, um, I wonder, you know, is there feasibility, like, you know, the commercial route, it doesn't work out. Um, there, there wouldn't be the option to work collectively further down the line, as you're saying. No, of course we, you know, we're we're we we've always worked collaboratively. But the if you would go down a process of building something that then needed to be changed, it would be a, it's a much different economic discussion than actually it hasn't been built. How can we give that value back to the community? It's more just a pragmatic approach that there's really an opportunity here to to deliver an extra amount of affordable. And it's not to say that you know we won't continue the dialogue and discussions. You know, I've been discussing with the neighbor plan steering group for um, approaching five years now, um, always in good faith. But it's just to acknowledge that once you build something and then have to change it, it's a different commercial discussion because you've incurred such costs. Of course. I'm going to take a couple of more questions if there are any, and I'm going to wind up on this. I think we've, uh, uh, we've certainly give Alex some, uh, some questions to think about this evening. Uh, Stefan Gavishak. Sorry, Ken. Um, yes, out, out of respect, you, um, you you quite rightly went to the members of the committee first. Uh, I, I did did put in the chat that I did want to speak on this. Um, so uh, a, a bit of a statement, then a, a couple of questions to Alex, please. Firstly, the statement, you, you've been absolutely upfront in actually saying that this site would be 40% affordable. And that was an, that's a very honourable position to take. Um, if you were included in the Henley and Harpston neighborhood plan for this, the development that you're wanting, uh, when could you get it delivered? Um, very quickly is the truth. Um, we are, we are um, you know, in, in a good position to move forward with detailed planning consent. Um, and so it would be a matter of months um, if we were just to move forward as is before it would be sort of you know shovel ready if you don't mind me using that term um, yes. so it would be it would be very quick you know we've we're we're a year and a bit into 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 the planning and you know we have our ducks in a row <clears> to move <throat> forward this this is something that we've long thought about because I've long um, you know said that this commercial space won't work um, but either way a few months several months before before being ready to build Oh, well, the first thing is I, I'm absolutely in favour of you converting commercial space into more homes or absolutely in that. There is, there is, a, there is another sort of like slight curveball in this that we could do both. You could actually, and I know you've talked about it in the past, we could build homes with workshops below them. And if they were social rental, um, and affordable, then you would actually get your commercial space, like a local craftsman building stuff, uh, below their below their their living space. So there is a there could be a win there in the design phase of it. Um, as Ken and I know, SODC have, have poured contempt on uh, on on us as far as commercial space is concerned by um, converting the Anderson House into housing which is a loss of employment to Henley. And then they have the cheek and the audacity to say Henley needs another hectare of commercial space. Mm. But the real thing I want to focus on is this, is, um, and it, this is a bit of a curveball. We have been talking over the last three nights, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, about social rental and about community land banks. And in fact, there was a presentation just before about a, a very exciting site that would actually deliver social rental, provided they had some uh, investment income going into it. 
Um, so I'm actually, and you might not want to answer this, that you actually being so generous in actually saying the extra 20 homes would be 45% affordable. <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't be so generous. Maybe you should stick to the 40%. But you actually say that that extra money that you would make as a developer, and I will state it bluntly, you are the developer of the land, um, or maybe some other money, uh, could actually go into a community land bank so that it actually makes this other site more viable. So therefore, that you actually benevolently give some dosh, if you like, to another site to enable Henley to fulfill its aspirations. What we need, and I'll put it bluntly as this, what we need, and this is a statement, then I'll come back to the question. We need about 50 social rental houses in Henley, one and two bedroom flats that people can afford at 500 quid a month, 50 of them. So we've got to look to ways of actually delivering that. And therefore, if you were able to commute a sum of money, it could be an open book process, maybe a sum of money into a land bank, it could be a win-win for all of us in Henley. Um, so that was sort of the question. Yeah, Alex, I don't really want you to answer that question because one would consider uh, you may be offering money to get planning permission. Uh, so, you know, I understand, I what, that, I understand what, what Stefan said. I'd rather, I'd rather well, you, you have planning permission and then maybe offer something. I, but I think to offer something before planning permission is the wrong way to go. I'm sorry, Stefan, but I, you know, no, no, I, 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 understand, I understand where you're coming I from. Respect, I respect that view. What yeah. I'm inviting is the Neighbourhood Planning Committee. Yeah to actually look at these, these issues, that um, if we have a site or s sites that are, that could develop, so do, do, that could offer social rental, but they can't afford to, mm. we've got to look creatively at this process. I, I think to be fair, over the last three evenings we've been doing this, I think this is one of the items that we have been pushing. I think everybody that's been here for the, for the three nights we have been pushing this every evening, yep. uh, you, you know, the social housing, you know, right. housing for everybody. So, uh, yeah, it's definitely out there on the street, that's for sure. I'll just take one more question and then I'm going to wrap up on this one. Uh, Catherine. Hi there. Thank you, Alex, for your, for your presentation. It's nice to see you again. Um, it's a little bit follow on from Donna. I think we're all surprised and elated that we've seen nature rewild itself on your site over these years. I don't know about you, but it looks completely different and somehow it looks rather great. Um, looking at your plans, you know, they are old. Now we're more enlightened about climate change, environment, loss of habitat, biodiversity, et cetera, et cetera. I think we're like-minded here that we want to, to be modern here and look to the future and sustainability. Um, my question is, oh, one more observation. From your plans, please update it. You're relying so much on your neighbors to um, sustain the greenery around your borders. You're quite denuded right up to your margins. You know, it's thickening margins and putting in hedgerows, maybe a pond and things like that. I know I think we're preaching from the same um, whatever sheet. <laughs> but anyway, my question is this. Um, please, will you think about that deeply? Do some more plans, ecologically minded. Uh, adhere to what we said some years ago about that you won't adopt a scorched earth attitude. Uh, we saw the dismay from the residents of Ship Lake and Henley alike about the destruction of the hedgerow that your neighbor, that the neighboring property did, Thames Farm. It was an outcry and we were very sorry about that. Please think about that. I'm sure you'll rise to the occasion and I'm looking forward to some new up, up to it modern plans. And we can always speak about this again. When no, we all okay. again, thank you. Thank you.
I think it's I think it's an important point. I, I, I'm not a hundred percent familiar with what the next steps are from here, um, but I presume there are next steps um, if if this is something that the neighbourhood plan committee wants us to move forward with. And there are obviously things that Councillor Plant has brought up, you've brought up, many have brought up um, that I think would be appropriate next steps to <laughs> further. Um, even um, you know Councillor Gurizak in terms of could there be some space for commercial um, as well, and could that could that work, and could that work effectively? Um, and again, not being an expert on the next steps, but I think these all would be the likely next steps that we would have to look at. Um, we might even want to look at um, uh, um, uh, sort of uh, uh, updating and refreshing a little bit on the marketing, just to understand where the current market is. Um, uh, so these are all things that we could look at as next steps. Thank you for raising it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to end the this part of the presentation. Uh, thank you for that um, very much, Alex. Uh, I think you've been fairly honest with us. Great presentation. And I'm sure we will see more of you over the next three or four months when we'll be having further presentations with the uh, with the residents. Yeah, thank but you. Uh, thank you very much for the evening anyway. Thank you all. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you. Have we got the the next one with us? Yes. Is that a yes or a no? Um, yes. Well, he Les Durant is showing us there. Ah, there. Just come up. That rings mm -hmm. a bell. That name. There he is. Good evening, Good evening, Les. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Um, we're ready to go straight into your presentation. You're going to do a presentation on um, on Thames Farm, uh, on a, a small piece known as the northeast corner of Thames Farm. Um, would you like to do the presentation on the screen? I can do it. Am I cleared to share a presentation? Yes, you are. You will be. So if I can okay. leave it over to you, you've got the, the working group from the, uh, the Joint Henley and Harpston neighbourhood plan, plus some other councillors, plus members of the public um, are watching this. Okay, I've been so watching. Ready when anyway. I've been watching uh, for the last half an hour, so I've been following the, uh, the discussion. And first, can I say thank you very much for the, uh, the opportunity to join you this evening and uh, present the uh, site at Thames Farm Barn and uh, just give you some ideas of what, where we are and uh, where we, we might be. I mean, we're making, making the presentation on behalf of our client, which is a company called Village Gate Shiplake Limited. And uh, I think, just for clarity, I, I'll pop a slide up which shows the site edged in red. That is what we call Thames Farm Barn, uh, certainly as of today. And the, the blue area is the land that's now uh, owned and controlled by Taylor Wimpy on the Thames Farm site. So the um, area that we're looking at, uh, Thames Farm of course has planning permission for 95 units and being developed by Taylor Wimpy. And the Thames Farm barn site is, is approximately just, uh, the developable part of that is just under half, an, half a hectare and the site currently has planning permission for conversion of the barn itself to about four, to four residential units with some adjacent garaging and car parking. Uh, that's a photograph of the existing barn structure uh, taken actually about 12 months ago. Um, as you can see, I mean, the site is still, although now surrounded by, by development sites, there's a lot of trees on the northern and eastern boundaries of the site and it still has a relatively rural appearance. The barn itself is substantial structure and it's a fairly, uh, fairly large structure with windows in the roof to give it natural light. Uh, it's on the edge of Ship Lake and the tree belts around it are actually protected but notably there are no main sort of trees or, or landscape features within the site itself. 
to give an indication of the substantial structure is a large steel framed barn. Uh, but that being said, outside, it's got some details which are reminiscent of local architecture, with flint and, flint and brick panels, uh, timber cladding. So it's uh, not, not unattractive. The roof is plain tile. And as I said, it sits at the moment and has done for some years in a fairly rural structure. The slide I'm showing here is the approved scheme. That shows the barn in its converted form with garaging and carports, uh, cycle store, bin store um, added with the, helpfully it shows, I think, the extensive tree cover to the north and the east of the site. And just so people can understand how it fits with what's already approved around it, we've, we've dropped in the Taylor Wimpy approved scheme showing the allotments and the northeastern corner of their housing and the, the additional open space and substantial tree belt uh, at the front of Thames, Thames uh, Farm site adjacent Reading Road. The interesting thing I, I think we, we, we need to, to look at with the site itself, the Thames Farm barn site, is building on from the conversation that I've uh, followed from earlier presentation the area is, is changing. This site now is, is basically encircled by Thames Farm to the west and the south, the existing built up part of Ship Lake and appreciate we're looking at the very corner of Ship Lake where it meets Harpston here and further housing development scheduled further to the north. So effectively the new developments will, will encircle the Thames Farm site. That's an indication of just how substantial the barn is. It, it's the, this is a drawing showing the approved elevations of the four unit conversion scheme, which is predominantly two stories, but with an element of uh, open plan space in the loft. What we've done through the neighborhood plan process is the review of the neighbourhood plan obviously provides an opportunity to look again at this site and do that in the context of new developments and new needs that are arising partly with the passage of time since the last neighbourhood plan, the review of the South Oxfordshire local plan of course and the issues that that's grappling with and also the changes that are inevitably going to follow in post-COVID-19 life. So the neighbourhood plan is, is, is really being revisited at a very fortunate time in some ways, uh, with these issues being very much in, in our forefront of our mind at the moment. And your consultants have recognised, I think, that the site uh, is placed close to new and existing development and clearly has a role to play. The question is, what is that role? And in looking at it, uh, your consultants have suggested that it might be suitable for eight units. What we've done, uh, and the scheme that I'm showing on the presentation at the moment, is not meant to be a proposal. This is a feasibility exercise that we've taken the same barn without extending it or doing anything other than just revisiting how we might look at it uh, if your consultant's view of eight units turns out to be uh, the right one, as it were. And as you can see that the barn, the structure very conveniently allows us to convert what would have been four larger units into eight smaller ones. You're looking at three story, three bedroom family units of a, in round terms, about 1100 square foot apiece in a scheme that is designed to meet South Oxfordshire uh, space standards for private, uh, private gardens and car parking. And I think what this exercise does without sort of laboring a point one way or the other, is taking the numbers suggested by your consultants and saying, well, even just converting the barn, it would work. Clearly, you could redevelop the site for the same number of units in that form or a different form. Um, and I think it, it's a feasibility exercise. It's simply defining the art of the possible. I think that uh, the next slide that I can show you just gives you an indication of the, the units. 
uh, and the fact that the, this is a, an exercise which has been done architecturally as well as just in terms of uh, planning feasibility. So moving on from that, what, what would we like to achieve through the neighbourhood plan? Well, I'm not actually recommending to the neighbourhood plan committee that there's a, a finite solution here because clearly the scheme currently has a benefit for a, a, a one unit conversion, four unit conversions, and prompted by your consultants, we've looked at how it might actually be converted to eight units. And clearly that in itself works. So what, we are, what are we asking for? Before I actually answer my own question there, can I, can I say, I think having worked in the sort of Hopton, Chip Lake Henley area over you know, 15, 20 years, um, I'm very conscious of some of the needs and some of the uh, requirements of the area. And I think that I'm also conscious at the moment of looking at the way in which the COVID-19 impact is going to result in changes in the housing market. I mean, we're seeing a lot of change being talked about at the moment, possibly conversion of commercial space. And commercial space tends to be, for the most part, in urban areas, and the resulting space tends to be one or two bedroom units or even studios, which tends to appeal to those people with not having large families who are happy to live in urban areas. And watching the output from research also, it, there seems to be a very strong prospect. We'll see an increase in that trend and you're seeing it already in Henley. Um, the impact of that in one direction may mean that housing in villages like Ship Lake or the other sort of rural areas around Henley may well be the more of a demand for the family housing. So it, we don't know. We're having to wait and see that what the post-COVID landscape in the housing market is going to look like. The feasibility study we've done, I think, is very useful because it shows that you can you can do four fairly large family units within a barn and still have space to spare. You can convert the barn for eight smaller family units. I think the the answer here is: Were my clients contemplating making any further pr proposals for the site? It's almost certainly likely to be when we have a better understanding of how the housing market will look in six or 12 months time. And therefore, I think, and in saying this about the Tenton Barn site, my comment might actually be applicable to quite a few sites in the, in the neighborhood plan area. You need to approach the whole housing allocation or, or even employment site allocation for that matter, with a degree, I think, of caution and flexibility, because we don't really know what the market's going to be calling for in 18 months, 36 months, let alone five years. So we would we would suggest, firstly, that the Thames Farm barn site now is effectively viewed as a brownfield site where the residential use for the future has already been established by not one, but two planning permissions and that it might be identified and make a very useful contribution, albeit small, but it's nonetheless useful contribution within the, the housing content of the coming neighbourhood plan for a residential scheme of, and we would use the words very cautiously here and say up to nine units. I, I think to give you a specific figure would be entirely the wrong thing to do at this point in time. Uh, but I think clearly there needs to be an upper, upper figure set towards that because this is a relatively small site. The trees on the site clearly need to be protected. They have been and they should be in the future. We recognize that. And although there are no particular um, nature conservation interests here that are at risk, we have had bats. We've got extensive information on wildlife, dormice, bats, so on and so forth from the work that was done over a very long period of time on Thames Farm. We're also conscious of the fact that the current national planning policy framework policy is to uh, achieve as government sanctions uh, a net increase in net increase sorry in biodiversity at the end of the day so our uh, our presentation is, is not not a proposal it, it's i hope some food for thought about how we can contribute to the output of the neighborhood plan uh, so, Chair, if, if you're happy with that I, I can go back over any of the slides if you would want me to or i can i can click out and come back as it were in person. I, I think that's enough, um, Les, if I can call you Les, because um, I would imagine there'd be 
quite a few questions on on what you've raised. Could I just have raised the first question? Are you talking about pulling down the barn and rebuilding? Is, is that one option? We've not been talking about that to date. Uh, the, the, the permissions that we, we've established, one was uh, a single unit permission to establish the principal, uh, but this was going back a long while. Uh, in a different you know, housing landscape, we were looking at Thames Farm as a, as a farm and a barn as a straightforward single unit barn conversion. Following the Thames Farm proposal, the, the barn's been consented for, for conversion to four units. Um, and what I showed you tonight was a, was a conversion of the barn to eight units. So conversion is a substantial structure. Um, and in terms of looking at its future, it could be kept and it could be converted. For the same token, um, depending upon what was required, you can only convert, convert a steel frame barn structure like that effectively by looking at the steel frame and, uh, and subdividing really around the structural components. So I think that if you were looking at a mixture, I mean, again, it comes back to the point about what sort of housing would that kind of site they be required to produce, say, in two years' time, in a, in, in a different different market completely, it's probably going to be family housing rather than first-time buyer units, I would suggest, because the way the market seems to be responding to the COVID situation is there's an awful lot of office floor space being converted to flats, and those are mainly studios and one and two beds, right across southern England. And I see a lot of the smaller units coming from those sort of conversion schemes and larger family units further in the more rural environment. So I don't know is a short answer. Uh, it's possible that the barn structure could be replaced with, with new build uh, that could be positioned in, in the same or even a different way on the site. We've looked at various options. As I said, I think at the moment we, we, want, we need to see how the market responds to the circum economic circumstances we find ourselves in and then, uh, and then look at detailed proposals in the future. When you say, and I've come to questions, when you say we have looked at uh, different proposals, could you let me know who we is or is that private? No, no, I mean, we've, we've been working, DPDS has been working as, as uh, planning consultants, urban designers and, uh, and architects on this site for over 10 years, um, during which time we, we've looked at the barn. Uh, we looked at it some long time ago to, to consider and did actually renew a permission for conversion to B1A office use. So that proves completely unviable. So uh, again, as, as market conditions change, schemes become viable, they become unviable, the market points in different directions. And at the moment, we're in a very volatile situation because of the, the health crisis. Um, I wouldn't like to be you know, too, too dogmatic at all about how I think the site might look in say two years time. I think it clearly looks like a housing site to me, um, but what what shape and form those those houses take, I think we we all need to keep a, a reasonably open mind, so that we can adjust our position to respond to market conditions. Yeah, I, I think my question was was you know who are you representing? We're representing the uh, the company that has acquired the the interests of Thames Farm Barn yeah. from okay. this is English. Okay, uh, Lawrence Plant. Uh, sorry, I, I might be slightly wrong or confused or lost in my interpretation. But so, kind of, you're looking for inclusion potentially in the neighbourhood plan, but with almost a blank piece of paper as to what you would then do with it. Is that correct? No, I don't think so. I think we what we uh, what we said was that uh, we would we would like uh, if we were included in the neighbourhood plan to be identified as a potential housing site. We're not asking for anything other than housing. We're not asking for a blank check. We are happy to be allocated for a housing site. And I said the, the to, 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 to set a sensible density range, we said up to nine units. I think from the work that we've done in looking at anything larger than that, it would be a more urban scheme that would not be appropriate to the rural location, which I picked up in my, my presentation. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to avoid being very specific and saying, here's a proposal today that we might make a planning application on if included in the neighbourhood plan in, say, two years' time, because I think the market, I think we're going to see some big changes in the market. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, thank you. That that's perfect. And if I, if I can just follow up on that briefly, it's just um, I couldn't agree with some of your statements more, as it were. I think you know office spaces are going to be changed into flats, but I think you know from most of the studies so far, those are going to be in urban areas. That's going to be the likes of Reading, where they've built far too much office space already. London and etc. As it were, you know, I think you know we all know as councillors, uh, members of the public, and members of this committee that you know, as we've discussed for the last two nights, the one thing Henley is desperately short of is smaller affordable housing so i would be upset to see this site get turned into you know let's say three rather large family homes such as ship lake is already certainly full of and there's two more being built just down by the lock end corner plot at the moment starting at 1.25 a piece and it was a breakdown of a of a larger plot which two or three five beds have been built on so i think it would be it would certainly be a shame to see a site like this, given its soon to be surroundings, um, end up in a similar situation. You know, my preference would be to see it go towards <coughs> a lovely barn structure, just as you've described. I think the sound of the, you know, the the three floors and even the layout, the, you know, they, they look good and that looks like something Henley, Henley Harpston, Shiplake could benefit from, uh, depending on the price, obviously. Yes, yeah, so and I can come back on that, Chair. I, I, I think that's really what we're saying, that uh, we, we, we don't want to come up with a, a single proposal today when the neighbourhood plan is looking, I think, to establish sites that can produce a quantity overall uh, and establish principles, and the detail follows for the development control system and planning applications further down the line. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I'm agreeing with you. I think that... Uh, we've moved from one to four uh, in terms of what we think we would do with this this site. And I think we're moving, we're trying to follow the steering <coughs> board consultants who said eight. And we're saying, well, we, we've done a feasibility study on eight and it works very comfortably. So we're drawing the line at nine because we think that, you know, an element of new building there already has been uh, contemplated for the provision of uh, garaging, carports, uh, bicycle stores, things like that. Um, we think that you know if we put a cap of nine units on there with a, a, an allocation for residential use we would hopefully be in that sort of ballpark order of family homes and uh, and not just doing one or two units perfect thank you uh, uh, donna and then stefan i um two questions really um can you guarantee that all those trees that are behind that barn will be retained and none will be destroyed um We've certainly not tried to, to, to do any harm to any trees down there. I, I heard some comments made about uh, removal of hedgerows. I can assure you that uh, our landscape architects and our agricultural consultants have, have done their best uh, to make sure that those trees have stayed in good health. Um, what I must say is, is that, you know, when trees grow in, in tree belts and they get to that level of maturity, as we found on the main Thames farm site, we had dieback, we had dangerous trees in there, which we agreed with the council uh, forestry officer that in the interest of public safety, actually, they had to come down. Um, good husbandry really is what, uh, and good management about woodland is important. I think I would invite uh, members of the, the, the council and, and the uh, neighborhood planning committee to have a, have a stroll down Bolney Lane and, and look at some of the trees that are in there. I have a concern that uh, those trees need managing not removing there may, there are some that are not in very good health and uh, we you know we will we will be talking we're already in dialogue effectively with the council uh, on the permission that we have there are conditions that had to be discharged including landscaping and trees so we're not intending to vandalize trees to put it bluntly but there are there are there are elements of work to trees that need to be done down there to make sure the whole belt stays in uh, in good health for the future Okay. They are protected. I mean, there's a preservation order on them, so uh, we're well aware of the need not to let them come to any harm. And, be w and being well aware of climate change, will you be putting solar panels and electronic ch ch car charging points for all the people that are moving there? So, because we want more people to become more greener, that would be Indeed. a good idea. We haven't, we haven't, we haven't, we don't have a detailed proposal, so obviously we haven't got around to that level of detail. Okay, John. It's, it's becoming, uh, Chair, if I can just add to that, it's yeah. almost standard, it's almost standard practice now for quality developments to have uh, what Councillor Crook is, is calling for, so I, I'm fairly sure that they will be provided. The, inten the intention when the scheme, for the last conversion scheme, 
was prepared, it's several years ago now, but was to include specifically uh, some outbuildings, effectively garages and carports that were designed to look like outbuildings to provide exactly that sort of facility uh, for bicycle stores in the interest of climate change and sustainable transport. So uh, I'm fairly sure that uh, such provisions will be will be taken on board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stefan Gavishak. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Les, for your, for your presentation. And you, you presented it very, very clearly. I, I'm at a slight loss as to what this contributes to Henley in terms of the Henley and Harpston neighbourhood plan. We've got a, an avowed aim to actually provide more social, more affordable, more whatever in the site. And it seems to me, I mean, Lawrence, I think, picked it up earlier that um, this your submission is is very vague uh, it might be four it might be eight or it might be nine of course if you actually push the button on 10 and actually then that would automatically trigger 40 percent affordable um it, it it might it might have some merits um we have a problem in the our existing henley and harpson neighborhood plan state that all sites, all sites, must deliver 40% affordable. And clearly yours doesn't in any way, shape or form. So I was wondering how you could um, square that particular circle of us wanting affordable, us wanting social rental, and clearly your site not doing it. Chair, are you happy for me to come in now? Yes, I'm go for it, yeah. Firstly, I mean, there's been not one but two sets of changes in national planning policy framework guidance since the the, the joint Henley Harpston neighbourhood plan was produced. And the national guidance now is sites over of 10, 10 units and over is the threshold for the provision of, of, of uh, affordable housing. And I mean, I'm not being facetious or flippant and saying, well, it's up to nine because we don't want to provide affordable housing. I mean, we've, we have, we've provided the full. 40% affordable housing on the Thames Farm main development uh, at a time when, you know, it was a dire issue in the, in, in the Henley Ship Lake area. So the site itself has, has played its part already in that sense. Uh, the feasibility work that we have done, I think when you get to something like 10 units plus, I would say that the site itself starts to, to <coughs> show signs of, of design stress, if I can put it uh, in that form. A, you have got parking standards to maintain and when every time you add to the parking requirement you take up space and it's, it's not a big site anyway, it's below the threshold for provision, the national, the national guidance threshold for um, affordable housing and then out of that site that I've shown you edge red tonight you've got to take out the two big tree belts. I mean I'm happy if you'd like me to pop that screen share back up and show you the slide. So I think we, we need to, I've, I've done the exercise in terms of going through this with, with architects, my own and other consultant architects, to try and establish where we think we might be, because we're, we're, following, we're following the neighbourhood plan lead here. The neighbourhood plan, of course, is, in a sense, and it has to, has to follow in turn, not just the South Oxfordshire local plan, but you have to follow the national guidance, and that, hasn't, that has changed. So I, I, I'm quite comfortable that what we're putting forward is a sensible threshold figure that is respecting national planning policy guidance and hopefully uh, that's going to be enshrined in both the new local plan and the neighbourhood plan. Um, I'm comfortable that we're not overdoing it in terms of the ability to deliver a quality scheme, including small units, if not you know, affordable in the definitive sense. But please bear in mind, Thames Farm delivered the full 40%. So I think on balance, you know, it, it, it's a reasonable package that has met its social obligations. Okay. Um, Matthew. <laughs> Matthew Phillips. You're on mute. Uh, so, sorry about that. Um, okay. Just, just with regard to access to the site, has any decisions been made around or is there any um, options around whether the access will be from the main road or from the bridleway um, to the side of the site? 
Thank you, uh, Councillor Phillips. Yep. The, the access, as approved for the uh, single and four unit conversion schemes, comes off Bolney Lane. And the access for the whatever scheme will be exactly the same. We have a technical note prepared by our, our highway consultants. And they have looked at the additional traffic generation up to sort of eight or nine units. And they're perfectly happy that the uh, uh, Sorrows Oxfordshire County Council Highway Standards are concerned, they're quite happy that that safety standard can be met. That would include, obviously, tarmacking a bellmouth, as it were, in the first section of Bolney Lane to make sure that there was a safe access, not only for vehicles going into the development of Thames Farm Barn, but Bolney Lane generally, and very importantly, pedestrians and, uh, and cyclists. Okay, thank you. I mean, that, that part of the scheme has been looked at in detail and I said we don't have a detailed proposal but that part of it is actually the only thing that I think you know you could go out and build tomorrow because we know exactly what it needs to be and it's been thoroughly discussed with the county council. <coughs> Jodie would you like to ask any questions at all? Um, I just wanted to just uh, go on from that point and just check that OCC highways are actually happy with a, a larger number on that site not just the four based on the planning application. Uh, to come back on that we have we haven't consulted obviously we haven't made a planning application so there hasn't been a formal consultation uh in terms of <coughs> OCC so I, I don't want to give the impression that we, we've done, done anything in a formal context like that but our traffic consultants are in you know routine contact with Oxfordshire Highway officers and they're, they're quite comfortable that uh, it, it's a barn conversion this is not a high it's a, not a, a housing estate development where you have an adoptable road for anything over five units this would be a, still remain a private road and a private development. Uh, the access, and, and just just for absolute confirmation, there will not be any new access onto uh, onto Reading Road, and there is no connection from this site through into Thames Farm. The, the original Thames Farm barn access <laughs> has already been closed as part of the Thames Farm development. Lawrence. Oh, plan. Uh, those of us last night, this is the same lane that we were discussing that goes up through to the AONB that has, is it the Thames Poultry Farm? Houses on the other end, which was that development of three. It's the same bridal path that Stefan was discussing uh, yeah. yesterday, as it were. So, you know, uh, as part of a consideration for the, the broader group is that obviously we were discussing, I think, an existing house at the end <laughs> plus three more. They were large properties with multiple cars each. And now we're discussing up to eight or nine units again with no doubt multiple units in each, just so that we understand we're still st talking about the same track. And then just to follow on, you know, um, Les, I believe you were you know, watching the, 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 the tail end of the previous uh, discussion when we were discussing kind of community land trusts and bits like that with Alex. You know, would it be something that the owners of the, the, the site that we're in discussion about now, if it was to come forward for smaller units, may consider one of, say, the eight or nine going towards something like a community land trust so that we could at least provide some social affordable housing? Um, if I can come back on that, uh, Councillor Pond, I, to be truthful, we, we have, we've done the feasibility exercise. But as I said, we haven't done a detailed design. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure the, the the company promoting the scheme would be very happy, uh, you know, to look at whether there's an opportunity to uh, to, to to meet that requirement. Uh, like all schemes, I mean, the the policy context nationally is quite clear. The the local plan one in South Oxfordshire, of course, is, is becoming clearer as days go by, and the neighbourhood plan will give us further, you know, fine texture within the uh, the policy context. So I, I think over time. You know, any, any, anything's possible to be looked at uh, subject to viability. Perfect. Thank you. I've got David Lloyd, a local resident, uh, to ask a question. Hello, thank you. Thank you, Les, for your presentation. I was just thinking, racking my brains from years and years ago when the barn was first built, I believe, by the Engbers family. The planning application was for that barn as a propagation place or for, or for growing plants in. And then over the years, it seems to have changed and changed and changed. And all of a sudden we're finding we've been roughshod again. 
over, you know, and all of a sudden we're finding we, instead of a nice, it'll be ship, ship Han, Harp, Henley on Thames in a few, a few years time, it'll all be built upon. So I was just wondering, was that actually planned or the planning permission wasn't ever thought about as a propagating or growing house? for Y Vales when Engbers were in charge of, of Engbers Garden Centre. It just seems to have evolved and just everybody seems to be out for the out for their out for their money, that's all. Anyway, that's that's that, that was just a point, Ken. Thank Would you, you like to respond to that, Les, or not? Well I can I can only respond as far as I know. I mean certainly in, in the time I've been involved with, uh, with 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 this particular property, which is a is broad order now, about sort of uh, eight nine years. I mean, the, the the barn. I mean, I showed you some photographs of the barn. I mean, it, it would have been a it would have been a massive risk if somebody was just trying to put a barn up and uh, you know with a with an off chance hope that they might get a conversion. I mean, it, it, it's a uh, residential agricultural well, building. There were um, certainly questions but, asked when it was. First, can da Dave, David, can you let him res respond, please? Uh, I mean, the, the fact of the matter is that I mean, the barn, the barn is there, and it has valid planning permissions and has for years. I mean, I think what's been before, we've we've had radical change in the planning system, and the needs have changed as well. And I think that the key thing now is not looking so much backwards, but looking forward. And I think that, uh, as I said to you earlier on, I mean, I think you know the biggest problem I'm having at the moment, not just with this site, but with all the clients I advise up and down the country. Is actually trying to get a view of you know where we're going to be in 18 months two years time and this so-called you know post-covid landscape i mean we're we're all facing desperate problems uh we're seeing we're seeing people losing their jobs hand over fist we're mm -hmm. seeing i mean i my my my, my building where my consultancy is based is run as a business center and it's virtually empty okay can, can we just you know, can we just keep to the um to the, to, to the building ability and keep a, an open mind as to uh, where we're going so i think we're asking here for a residential allocation for up to a number of units the details yeah. that be fixed in the future okay thank you thank well i'm going to take stefan i think kester and then back to jody yeah it, it, it's uh sorry les thank you thank you for your for your help and uh presentation this evening um i just want to ask a question is sort of when, when does a barn conversion become a mini housing estate I mean, you've already got extant planning permission for four dwellings. Uh, we we actually weren't happy with it, but you've got the planning permission for four. This is a barn con conversion, a single barn conversion that is now being grown into eight or maybe even nine dwellings going forward. Um, I think it's just stretching the envelope too far. Well, I mean, I can... Uh... I can yep. understand. I can understand the the, the the thought process there, but I, as I said, I think over time, you're going back, you know, nearly ten years to the point when the the barn conversion for a single single unit was approved. We're going back several years then, in different circumstances, when the uh, four unit scheme was was approved, and with the with the neighbourhood plan allocation of Wyvale garden centre and then the decision you know by South Oxfordshire to grant planning permission not for employment but for housing I mean the Thames Farm development uh, it, it, it's leaving Thames Farm and uh, you know if, if we're looking at saving the planet here for example it, it's in, in, in simple planning speak it's now a brownfield site it's had a it's had a use on it that is not agricultural uh, solely it's got a building on it the original buildings have been replaced by the current structure for, for agricultural purposes. It's surrounded by development. I mean, effectively, it's sensible to me as a planner in the interest of sustainability and you know, biodiversity and everything else to say, well, make the best use of it. <coughs> don't overdevelop it. And I'm actually asking you not to do that. Don't, don't, don't turn it into an urban block of flats or something. That's not what you want in ship, like I would think. No, but get the maximum, the optimum use out of that site means it's a greenfield phase somewhere else. And you know, this site's capable of being redeveloped or converted. Both. I'm not I'm not pushing one or the other. They're simply saying we've done the feasibility exercise, the options are open. In 18 months, two years, three years' time, when the neighborhood plan hopefully has allocated it and we can see where the market's going, 
you'll have a detailed planning proposal to look at. Uh, and in my opinion, if it's for a development of up to nine units, you will have a quality scheme that's making the optimum use of that site, which is really what you need to do in an area where finding new housing sites, you know, I know for local people, it becomes painful seeing greenfields develop. So this, this is an opportunity to get the maximum, not the maximum, but the optimum out of that site. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kester and then Jody. Uh, wasn't the barn conversion made conditional on using the existing barn uh, by a planning inspector? Uh, I don't think so, because the decision, the, the, the current extent planning permission for conversion to four units was, was granted permission voluntarily by South Oxfordshire District mm. Council. Um, and the conditions on there, there are pre-start conditions. In fact, we, 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 we had started that, we have started that process of implementing the permission because we had to go through the process of discharging the pre-start conditions. It, it uh, doesn't matter now, I think, but uh, David Lloyd is correct in uh, suspecting a very black path. This was the barn built illegally without planning permission by Claire Ingbers, which started the whole Thames farm disaster which was assisted, of course, by someone uh, going out of their way to undermine the district council's uh, planning uh, target achievement. Well, I, 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 I will decline to comment on that, if I might, uh, Sir George, because I think that, you know, the history, the history of that site has been, been the subject of, of several you know, planning inquiries in the past. And I, I, as I the said, word in the Kester, Kester, can you let him uh, finish, please? I think oh, I know I, where I, you're coming from. I, I, I understand. I understand the background there and, and the feelings. So I've been I've been involved in this project for long enough to, to do that. And I think the fact of the matter is, this has been investigated thoroughly to the council. It's been the subject of several planning appeals that have been heard by government inspectors, and 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 and, and the, the permission was actually was originally granted on appeal. And I think that you know that's. That's water under, to my mind, that's water under the bridge in the sense that we now have a site with not one but two valid planning permissions. And what, what I'm urging the neighbourhood uh, planning group really to, to look at is saying, look, this is, this is a site that's going to get developed. And you, through your neighbourhood plan, have the opportunity here to shape the future by saying, look, we can actually get something out of this site which will hopefully optimise its development yield. And in doing so, is making a big contribution to sustainability, and biodiversity, and all and climate change principles that I, I've heard tonight, and that your members are concerned about. So, don't overdevelop it, but make the best use of it, the optimum use. So that, that okay. that's my request. Okay. Um, I think we're getting similar answers to different questions, but uh, Jody, just ask your question, will you please? Um. So yeah, it would be good to. Uh, have a look at the actual structural report uh, to show that the building can actually be converted. Um, whilst the uh, MPPF is supportive of the reuse of buildings, it's actually how much you, you would be proposing to alter that and to extend to that and parking and other buildings that might incur. Um, it's important if it is taken forward and uh, is suitable for conversion that that is what happens rather than um, to just establish that it's the principle of residentials suitable on the site. So working with you to, to look at that would be good. Would you like me to come back on the... If you could, please, yeah. yes. Yeah. I mean, you're quite right. The, the, the barn has been the subject of structural uh, survey. So we're satisfied that the structure is capable of being converted in the fashion that we've... Uh, we've looked at for the scheme that has planning permission. We'll obviously need to look at it again if we change the scheme, but uh, I think the um, you mentioned the new build element. We, we, we suggested to the council when the four unit conversion scheme was considered that we put an L-shaped block, which again, if you'd like me to go back onto the screen share, I can put the plan back up and, and show you, but... Uh, no, it'll be fine, thank you. Okay, it's got an L-shaped block, which, which was... In, the, the design principle there was to sort of enclose the space where parking would be taking place with cars, and it would look, in the absence of any development at Thames Farm at that point, the conversion of the barn would appear to be more 
still a group of farm buildings in the countryside. So the new build actually helped create you know, enclosure and, 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 and screen urbanizing elements, if you can call cars that. Um, that's not to say that the new build element couldn't contain an element of residential development. I mean, we've never suggested that uh, just the residential element has to be contained to the barn. It's just been the convenient way of saying, well, we'll do it that way for a feasibility study. There may be more innovative and attractive ways of, of ending up with, with a scheme that looks more varied, that includes some of, the, some of the residential elements new build. I mean, I, we haven't ruled out the prospect of looking at a complete redevelopment. I mean, that, that is not something we're proposing, as I said, um, but, it, but it's always been something which if we were asked to, to produce something other than a line of units converted from the barn, if we were asked to, through the neighbourhood plan to, con, to, to produce, for argument's sake, a variety of sizes, that would be difficult to do within a barn conversion. So you may then say, well, the op opportunity arises to actually redevelop rather than convert. This is what I'm saying. I, I, I think it's too early to look at the detail. What the neighbourhood plan we would hope would do would look at the principle and actually establish the ground rules for a, a more detailed dialogue, you know, pre-application stage with the town council and I'm conscious here that it's the town council at Henley, we're right on the edge of Ship Lake and we're in Harpston. So there's three three groups of, of, of you know, town parishes that have a, a legitimate interest in this, this site. And I've always been prepared and I think, you know, Mr. George and one or two other councillors say, well, no, we, we, we've always offered to, to have dialogue even when there's been difficult times different views on these things so I'm still saying to you you know we we need to work together to achieve something on the site which we're proud of and you you're happy fits the mix in your neighborhood plan yeah. I'm gonna call a halt to this one now it's been going on uh, for nearly an hour uh, obviously thanks for your uh, presentation Les I think it's um, caused a few uh, concerns to to members that's what i'm i'm hearing i think we would really need a bit more detail i don't i don't want answers for this i think we we would we would prefer a bit more detail rather than it could be this and it and it could be that and i think when the presentation comes up to the public in a few months time i would suggest that there's uh, uh, there are some proper uh, plans put forward to show exactly what you really want rather than what may may happen i think it's just personally i think it's just just too uh, too far open at this moment in time but uh, i'll say thank you for your presentation okay. and uh, you know hopefully we'll catch up over the next <laughs> over the next few months through the neighborhood plan okay, okay thank yeah, you thank you very much for the opportunity it's a pleasure um right that's the end of our presentations for this this evening it seems to have been a long a long three nights um obviously thanks to the members for for turning up uh, on the three evenings, I think we've had um, I think we've had an excellent time. I think there's been some really good uh, um, presentations put forward. There's a lot to think about uh, now. A lot of information has come, come forward on the on the the proposals, uh, especially this evening. Excellent questions by the uh, by the working group by. Uh, Harps and Parish Council by members of the public. Thank you, David Lloyd, for, for coming this evening. Um, Thank you. As I say, I think we've got a lot to think about now. Um, so, as I say, final thank you to Kath and Jody for, for setting all this up. I think it's gone, gone really well. Yeah. And uh, I'm not sure what Catherine's laughing about, but there we go. But it's been, a, it's been, a, been really good. I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the three evenings. I think we've learned a lot. And uh, I think we'll be having some interesting debates in the future uh, when we meet up again. So thank you all for, for taking part and um, go and enjoy yourself now. Go and have a drink. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Bye.